love that you have come to listen to the latest episode of Elwood City Limits, an episodic, the, and the, well, it is an episodic Arthur podcast these days, but in my eyes, it's the episodic <laughs> Arthur podcast. And uh, a lovely love day, well, I guess past now, it's long past, but we hope that your Valentine's was a great Valentine's as it was for us. Uh, Will Young here. Lucas Mancini, you seem to have uh, done a, a wee bit of local traveling for Valentine's Day, if I were to trust your Instagram feed. Yeah, I got a little bit out of town, uh, went to went to the country, uh, and uh, um, yeah, just got a, a weekend away uh, to celebrate the weekend of love. And you know, that's not the only thing to celebrate this week. It's my birthday, Will. It's mm-hmm. Lucas Mancini Day. Yes, um, sir. It's the second ever ECL live stream coming up. Yep. Um, who says there's nothing to celebrate in February? Also, I believe in Nova Scotia, is it Family Day or whatever? Don't yeah, we have a no, weird no, Nova, random holiday. Nova Scotia Heritage Day, and I've also heard it called Family Day, is that's coming right. up on Monday. So that's technically a a day off. You get a nice like birthday long weekend. Yeah, it's it's really everything's coming up, Lucas, this week. Seriously. Knock on wood. Yeah, absolutely. By the time by the time our listeners are hearing this, uh, you know, knock on wood, and as long as you know COVID protocols hold up and all that stuff, you and I will actually be uh, partying in person for your mm, birthday mm. for Lucas Mancini Day. Mm-mm. It's true. That's behind the scenes, behind closed doors. Would a Jew, dear listener, uh, like to be? Uh, invited to my IRL birthday, but don't worry, we'll have a separate birthday celebration on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Elwood City Limits Pod, that you're all invo- invited to, invited, invited, you're all invited to. That's correct. If you're hearing this on Friday night or Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, we will be going live on Twitch, as Lucas said, twitch.tv slash Elwood City Limits Pod, 6 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Atlantic time, three o'clock Pacific is when we are going to be going live. So make sure to join us there. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to be ranking some PBS Kids theme songs. We're going to be, uh, well, we're going to be celebrating Lucas Mancini Day. This is your perfect opportunity to come in and wish us both. I mean, for everybody, it's a happy, it's a happy Lucas Mancini Day, and we can, uh, yeah, we can get up to all kinds of fun there. We had a great time doing it the last time, and I'm going to have a couple of surprises up my sleeve. For Lucas Mancini Ooh. Day, so Ooh. you better both, you be, you better make both, sure you tune in. I'm both excited and nervous. And on that, um, what do you call it? Nova Scotia Heritage Day. I uh, just want to remind everybody that the 21st is when the new slash final Arthur episodes are going to be released. Because by the time you've heard this, you've probably already been watching the Arthur Marathon on PBS, and they are going to be capping it off. With, I mean, Wikipedia has the date that they are airing as the twenty first. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent on that date, but very soon you'll be able to see the final Arthur episodes. I'm sure that we will do something, some manner of discussion or some manner of content for maybe the Patreon or something. We will be talking about the new Arthur episodes, if not in depth, then at least sparingly. Uh, because I I won't be able to stay away from watching at least the final couple of Arthur episodes myself. So, well, I'm sure it'll work its way into the discussion somehow. But we've got uh, non-new Arthur episodes to talk about. Before that, of course, a couple of things we always like to start with, including going to our mailbag, elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. Our first email comes in from Ash, who wants to wish congratulations on our YouTube channel, and the upcoming second Twitch stream. I actually went to your first one, and I had a question that you didn't get the chance to answer. No worries, but here it is. Back in 2000, the Cartoon Network put out a CD of music inspired by the Powerpuff Girls called Heroes and Villains. It's pretty much an audio episode of the show featuring voice acting from the cast interspersed with songs for each character by different artists like Devo, Shonen Knife, The Apples in Stereo, etc. What I wanted to ask both of y'all is what artist would you pick to be on a similar Arthur-inspired album? Which artist would you pick for which characters? What would be the plot of the album, still loving the show. Thanks for all the hard work you put into it. So, like a ca- so like a character, almost like a concept album, but with different artists on it. Um, 
It's funny, we just had the discussion a few episodes ago about Binky looking like he's in a hardcore band. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, Binky uh, would Binky's band would be like Youth of Today or something. Um, and he would be talking about how he doesn't need a crutch. He's straight edge to the end. Um, it's f- interesting. This is a really fun uh, prompt. Uh, and I didn't know about that Powerpuff Girls album. It's crazy that they got Devo. Um, yeah. I'm thinking about... Let's say this comes out, in my opinion, during the golden age of Arthur, right? Like seasons one to three, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, 1996 to uh, 1999. Um, I'm thinking about what were the oh. big bands at the time. And I would go with uh, Pavement. I think Pavement would be a fun band, whether it be, you know, doing Arthur's theme or maybe The Brain or someone else's. I think it's a fun mix of kind of you know slacker indie rock with some of the more well-read sensibilities uh that arthur is known for and some of those guys in pavement kind of dress like arthur characters given (laughs) the time period um what about you will who would you go with was blind melon still around in 97 or was or was he melon was or was he or was he dead by that point um i I don't know it's uh, 97 well i mean of course if we're talking about then we have to we have to go back in time and start the seed the germ of the backstreet boys involved in arthur so they got to do i'm gonna say they gotta muffy's gonna pull some strings and have them sing a song about her maybe um 97 98 you could probably get hansen Along with the Backstreet Boys. It's true. I didn't even think about people who would guest start on Arthur. You know, you could really just do a best of, of, you know, Yo-Yo Ma, Art Garfunkel. Mm -hmm. Um, What was Francine's uncle named? Oh, uh, Josh Josh Redman. Yeah, exactly. Um, Oh, there was one more I had um, in terms of late 90s artists. (laughs) I I was all ready to, like, do... I was I was ready to start thinking modern, but I like that you placed it in a time when Arthur was really hitting in terms of its core audience. So, uh, oh, the one I was thinking of is that you got to do like a comedy style thing for Buster, and it's probably even easier to get Weird Al in like '98. Oh, true, true. Oh, and you know Buster what? Song. This is a little bit later, but the perfect perfect music for the tough customers. Yes, Limp Biscuit. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> they, you Try know, to... they they would be trying to break stuff. This one's for my favorite MF Rattles. <laughs> it's just Rattles. Wonderful. Rattles actually kind of dresses like Fred Durst. Now that I think about it, with the with the backwards red cap, he does kind of. It, 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 Fred Durst has like the has like the short sleeves and the shorts going on, but the attitude, the tood, is very much there. Yes. Um, some more thought I think should be put into this and we invite you to uh, answer this question either on our patrons discord or in another email. Who do you think would be on an Arthur album writing for whom and why? Our next one comes from Vinny. Now Vinny had had an email a couple weeks ago and he wants to clear some things up. I do not think Arthur's parents are bad parents. I just think that they needed to show Arthur and DW that their actions could end up with consequences. Will, you brought up that the punishments might not have been severe enough. Uh, I did? Oh, okay. I thought it was the other way around, that, but whatever. And I do agree that some might not have been, but from an audience perspective, it would have been nice to at least make reference to the parents having a talk with DW or Arthur. Like, if DW goes to Washington, you're right that we don't need to see the talk, but at least make it somewhat clear that they did have a talk. Like, if DW started to complain about the trip, have Jade or David say, uh, remember the talk we had? Be nice on the trip, please. Another episode I forgot to mention was Arthur's chicken pox. Throughout the episode, we see DW sitting very close to Arthur when he is sick, and yet Jane and David say absolutely nothing to her to move away from him. I know you probably aren't going to blame put blame on Arthur's parents, but I think they need to make it clear to DW that Arthur's chicken pox is incredibly contagious. And in the end, DW catching it could have been avoided if something was said. I suppose, Vinny, but I think that you could also infer that they are the type of parents who are like, uh, better to get chicken pox over with yeah. when they're younger. I was just going to say, isn't the strategy to get chicken pox as early as possible? I've heard of, like, parents doing literal, like, chicken pox play dates when yes. kids are, are younger in order to induce the chicken pox. Because I'm to understand it's much more serious if you get it when you're older. I think it's also just more, un- yeah, it's more annoying. And, you know, I had chicken pox when I was 
three? Like, there's a picture of me when I was, like, two or three. Like, very, very young. And there is the idea of, like, once you get it out of the way, it's, like, you know, it's an annoying week for your kid. But then it's, like, over with. Um, I don't know what the prevailing wisdom is nowadays. It just seems like you hear, oh, parties where your kids go to get infected. And that sounds post COVID. That sounds like that sounds like dystopia itself. So I don't know if we're doing that anymore. But um, yeah, I don't know what the prevailing wisdom is for that nowadays. I do know that that would have been um, something that wouldn't have been a strange point of view at the time. I want to touch on an email sent in the last episode about how Brain was a decent character. There are many instances where his moments cause me to fall on the ground laughing, like in the Substitute Teacher episode when he runs out of the classroom at the end of the day. About this week's episode, I personally do not like them. Kate and Pal just aren't one of my favorite duos, and this episode didn't change my opinion. As for Pride of Lakewood, I don't like how Brain and Sue Ellen are ridiculed for them not caring about what everyone else is doing, and the ending was just kind of stupid. Just had to get some things off my chest. There's Vinny. And of course, we'll get into all that. Our final one comes from Hannah. This is my first email to the ECL podcast. I have been listening since the summer of 2020, and it has been a joy. Podcasts have been significant throughout my life, especially those relating to pop culture and animation. Uh, currently a senior in high school, and this podcast, along with the DJ Bob show and the back catalog of Samurai Pizza Cast, has allowed me to decompress whenever times get difficult or stressful. No questions, just wanted to send an email. Looking forward to the next episode and the stream on Saturday as well. Wish you both a happy Valentine's Day and upcoming Lucas Mancini Day. And those are all our emails from Elwood City Limits at gmail.com. As always, feel free to contact us about practically anything even if it's not something you want to be read on the air you can always let us know in the email and finally before we get into the episode itself we want to thank our lovely patrons i want to give want to make sure that one of the patrons we thank today is one that we got a lovely message from on discord and that would be michaela michaela has uh, uh emailed us in the past about how um, she has been undergoing cancer treatments. And it has been a very good part of my week. I'll just read from the Discord here. This is what you're missing if you're not in the Discord. Uh, Michaela, first of all, on the Frensky Star website, wrote up a paragraph about what Arthur means to me. I did the same as well. And I believe, Lucas, you're going to be having one featured on the Frensky Star too, hopefully soon. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, I submitted mine last week. That's on thefrenskystar.com. I'm happy with what I did. Michaela's is good, too. And update, this is we read her email on the episode about the Great McGrady. Michaela is now two months in remission and still symptom-free. So, Michaela, that was a wonderful thing to read, and we're very, very happy for you. Thank you for sharing that with us. So, along with uh, wonderful people like Michaela, we have other great people we respect and love a great deal like katie laura ashley we have infra 90 sarah and matt we have rg and j wags we have charlie heckman and alex k we have gabby s we have jhc and greenhouse vinyls we have hannah kitten we have valeria and i'm gonna go to the second page to talk about Ursula Cat, Michelle Sprzynski, Rachel Pearson, and Jake Bailey, and Shander Lefave Boten. Thank you all for your support at patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. Our most recent episode of For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast, which our patrons got to enjoy, was all about It's a Big, Big World. Uh, a, a little remembered but interesting part of PBS Kids history. We'll tell you a little bit more about the next episode. Near the end of this one. But it's time to talk about Arthur. And yes, as it was alluded to, we are doing a Pal and Baby Kate episode. Perhaps the final one. This is Paradise Lost. I was really confused because I was like, wow, we're finally going to see Arthur's take on the John Milton classic. You know, one of the foundational pieces Mm -hmm. of literature in the Western canon. How is Arthur going to tackle you know the heavy concepts of satan and adam and eve and beelzebub and moloch and um angelic war uh and it turns out uh it's not about that at all so it seems that your expectations were 
uh, a bit frustrated, I might say. Well, it's funny because, believe it or not, um, I, I'm going to give the Arthur writers a little bit more credit. Um, as we get through this episode, um, it does earn its namesake. It does play with this very loosely um, mm. the themes of Paradise Lost. Actually, maybe not so loosely. Okay, let's get into it because I think it's very, very interesting uh, that they picked, again, the name of this really, really famous um, and foundational uh, old poem uh, to be uh, to be the name of this episode because it, it, there is a little bit more of a through line um, than I initially suspected. I was being facetious earlier. I did not expect this to be a direct adaptation of John Milton's Paradise Lost. I, I, I it's okay. I didn't really, uh, I, I, I caught, I caught onto the joke, but yeah, it is, it is a bit of a heavy title for this. So the cold open has to do with how it's uh, focus on DW for a moment about how DW is having ha- to have more responsibilities as she gets older, as her as her dad, Dad Reed, is a, is a little bit more is a little bit more instructive as to how he believes her behavior should be. But it also means she gets a bit more freedom now that she's a bit more grown up. She can go with Arthur to chase down the ice cream van. Now, this um, the kind of directions that Dad Reed gives are very very parental, and it made me flash forward a little bit to if I'm ever lucky enough to have kids. I feel like one of the hardest rules to impart is going to be the sit up straight rule, which is what dad tells DW. And I just, I remember being told that as a kid and just, it's the hardest fight to have because it's impossible to explain to kids how important posture is almost until it's too late. Yeah. I, I, I still, I wish I had an adult telling me to sit up straight now. Well, and that's that's like all those tweets that are like, unclench your jaw, drink water, sit up straight, put your shoulders back. We need that because it's really, really easy to forget. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I just, it's just something that's, it's all, it's all long term. So trying to explain that to a kid is going to be impossible. So that's the idea behind this episode. But the actual matter of it has to do with we have Kate and Pal like wrestling in the front like like I see the like I see all these families nowadays doing the cute content of like here's the dog and here's the baby and the baby loves the dog and the dog loves the baby but they're all very like you know hands off me. This is they're straight up they're straight up throwing down here. We we we've, we've encountered this before on the show. I feel like there's and I, I you know I don't blame you, Will. You didn't grow up with a dog, right? No, I didn't. No, so I I've heard your anxieties around dogs around babies before. Uh, I I think it's something we've tackled around the show. But the the baby is safe. The baby can wrestle with the dog. In fact, I would be more worried about a small dog like Pal than I would be about the baby because the baby's just gonna tug on whatever it gets a hold of. Whereas I think dogs um, have a sense that you know babies are both innocent and delicate. And they treat them as such. Yeah, mm, but if they're if they're trained properly, and Dal and Pal is trained very well. Of course, that's yeah. that's what it all comes down to. Is if it's training. a Rottweiler, sure. If it's a Dingo, yeah, it's gonna eat the baby. But any family dog, unless you're completely irresponsible, you could leave the baby with it, and it's gonna be fine. It's not gonna eat the thing. Sure, it's just those it's those uh, exception to the rule scenarios where it's like that's what happens, and just like oh god, it's just enough to make you worry. Anyway, the of course in my perspective, future family, we're not going to be having dogs and babies at the same time. That's nuts. So th- yes, the baby and the dog are going two out of three falls here, and then Kate begins to be unable to hear Pal in English. We're all used to the. The we the weird and like not not terribly appropriate pal voice that's that's he he sounds like this he's a little bit more posh yeah, but then he just he, starts he's, he's sounding like, a missing, like pal he's like the 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 third Fraser brother or something <laughs> yeah the third Crane yeah uh, Fraser Fraser Niles and Pal Crane um, but yeah you're right that's not too far off that very uh, up it's if it's not British it's very like mid Atlantic like mm-hmm. upper crust snooty and then he. And he starts intermittently just barking, and Kate doesn't quite realize it, but she's not able to hear everything that Pal's saying. This is also going on at the same time where Kate is beginning to say her first words. Now, 
an, a, a real Arthur scholar here could probably school me because we've had Kate say like almost words. Like I remember that time she said bluege agua, but <laughs> it's I think this is this this has got to be like the first instance of like her canonically saying like a word, and her first word is uppy. And she also says, all done. And mom and dad, Reed, are very, very excited. DW, a little weirdly rude of just how, you know, mom is just like, it's like she's learning to speak. And then DW gets this, like, stinky look on her face. She's like, learning to speak gobbledygook. And I'm like, <laughs> we, okay. So well, she's like, jealous, right? And this is actually yeah. a fun kind of layer that's added throughout this episode it's barely i wouldn't even call it a b plot it really no, is it's... the pal and kate show but there is a little bit of a through line of dw is a little bit indignant that as kate grows up she gets a little bit more of the attention so i thought that was a nice detail they don't give it full on b plot status but it's sprinkled no. throughout the episode kind of with the kind of looks she gives kate and stuff like that i want to circle back really quickly though you yes. know i audibly groaned when we started this episode Oh, really? Uh, because I didn't know it was going to be a Pal and Kate episode. Again, I was thinking about Milton the whole time. So I uh, I was like, oh, man, it's one of these. Um, and then I was pleasantly surprised because there was whiplash. Immediately after they introduced Pal and Kate, we get that moment where Pal can no longer – or Kate can no longer understand Pal. And I was really intrigued. I was like, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. They're doing something where there's implications to this. We talk about this all the time. It's very rare – that we see the effects of Arthur characters growing because they're like Simpsons characters. They're static. They never age. They're always in the third grade. So this has some pretty big implications for the show that Kate could eventually grow to the point where she doesn't understand Pal anymore. Um, so at that point, I was intrigued. Also, yes. I want to know, what was your first word, Will? I'm not sure I know. Uh, it's probably logged in my baby book somewhere, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know. To be honest, with you. do you know yours? Yeah, so mine was everybody's got the ma and dad and, and stuff like that, but sure. mine's more similar to Kate. It's a very kind of functional one. Kate was saying uppy. I said hot. I would go up to the Ooh. stove while it was off and I would go hot, hot, Aww. which I think speaks to uh, the protectiveness of my mom. She probably it, it ingrained it in my brain uh, to stay away from the stove because it's dangerous. And it's going to be frequently hot with all the with all the pasta sauce that's going to be mm, made mm, in the Mancini mm. household. And I'm picturing you as a baby, and it really is just like a case of I'm just putting your adult face on like a baby body. So yeah, it's I'm, like baby Mario is what you're picturing. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Just you, you getting caught in a bubble. <laughs> um. So that's the idea behind where we're going with this, and they get the explanation from Amigo, who usually turns up in these episodes. This is the Melina's dog from next door. And he explains that uh, this is a fact of life. Eventually, babies and dogs become unable to understand each other. So there is this linkage between them when babies are born, but then eventually humans forget how to do this. And he illustrates this with Visita, who was apparently able to understand Amigo at some point, but then stopped. We get here, okay, so we, we get like, okay, Kate's canonical first word. I'm like, okay, that's something. And like you said, there's a bit of implications for what's going on here. Then we get a flash forward. This is more of like a bad dream, but it's still really interesting. We get a flash forward of old pal and teenage Kate. Even if it's not canon, it's still cool because we get to see the um, the animators and, and artists like bust out. So like pal is... Like the size, like the size, more of like a normal golden retriever. He's not a puppy anymore, but he's also got this weird, like old man face. He's got like the yeah. white eyebrows and stuff, and he looks it. It looks a little creepy. Like I'm yeah. not a fan of it, but it, it was interesting. He's a tad haggard. Um, yeah, they like they draw bags under his eyes. Um, and Kate is dressed. Um, you know, we get to see adult Kate's haircut, adult Kate's outfit. Um, and to my knowledge, this is the first time we've ever seen Kate as a teenager. So it's kind of a big deal. Um, considering, you know, we've seen the the rest of the Arthur crew um, since, like, early seasons in Flash Forwards as adults. Um, but this is the first time we've gotten something like this with Kate. And she's a redhead, too. I, I mm -hmm. found that very interesting. It's a bit like seeing uh, uh, teenage Maggie Simpson in that exactly. uh, Flash Forward episode of The Simpsons. So I thought, anyway, I was just like, oh, I did not expect them to do that at all. Uh, it was a little bit of a shock to the system. So they determine, or Pal determines that, they have to visit 
a certain animal that can help them with this. He heard it from somebody else about how there's a wise llama at the Elwood City Zoo. It's not called the Elwood City Zoo. It's called something. I think it's called the Eastman Zoo, I want to say. So they managed to convince DW. Uh, DW is reading like a magazine and they flip over to a, an advertisement for the zoo. And then that gets it in her head that they should go to the zoo. And it's funny when they go to the zoo and it's just like animals and pens. DW is like, well, this is boring. Nah. <laughs> just yeah, she was asking about like, like, why isn't there unicorns and stuff like that? Right. Um, she wants the Mary Moo Cow bubble bath instead. And then we get like a little bit of moment of magical realism as uh, DW uh, or rather Kate and pal trek up this this uh mountain to go speak to this this the llama that they've been talking about and all of a sudden um it's as if they've gone to a portal into tibet uh yes and they trek to the top of this mountain um to meet with it's not just any llama it's the dolly llama do you get it will do you understand yeah. the play on words yeah 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 <laughs> They understand. Yeah. I, I, I also wanted to note that they're shown the way to this by um by like a friendly cow. And I I liked this cow's voice. It was they were like, Do you do you know where to find the Dalai Lama this uh this like all knowing llama? And the cow just goes, Moo yes, right this way. <laughs> it's just a good good reading. So yeah, the doll the Dalai Lama is who they find. And it's the the old the classic joke of how it goes from a very like wise and serene tone, and then the, K- Kate and Pal aren't really picking up what she's putting down. And eventually, she's just like, she's just like, look, this is how it's going to be. You're not going to be able to hear him after a while. Like she goes into like a Brooklyn kind of accent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she almost sounds like the nanny. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of actually, like that that sort of like uh, New York accent, and just like, haha, yes, not so. Uh, not so, uh, not so wise after all, and then. The, but that's basically all they learn is that nothing can really be done about this. So they go all this way and just be like, "Yep, this is gonna happen." So in order for this to stop this from happening, Kate tries to effectively stunt her own growth. We get a little bit of a not physically, but we get like a montage of Kate regressing a little bit. So instead of eating her food with a spoon, she puts the food on her head. She refuses to speak. She makes a mess of things. And mom and dad are like up all night reading parenting books of just like, I don't know what's happening. I, she seemed to be progressing so well. Now she's regressing. So they're completely stumped. And <laughs> There's a funny moment in, during that where they're like comparing the knowledge of the parenting books. Like it's a little bit of parenting book humor of like, this guy says it's this, but this guy says it's this. Right. And I I mean, it's a little bit over my station, but uh, we'll see. The family goes to visit Grandma Thora. And I also appreciated this. Um, Killer's back. So, like, was it last season or the season before? It was semi-recently that we had that episode about Grandma Thora adopting that little uh, abandoned dog named Killer. And it's just like, it's like a little, tough little puppy with like a gr- uh, kind of girly, high-pitched little voice. And they talk to Killer, and the whole thing is that Grandma Thora can understand understand Killer in the way that, uh, Lucas, I'm sure you as a dog owner, uh, you, both you and your dog can understand each other. So it's like, when they're making this noise, it means this. So Killer makes a very specific whine, which means that she wants to play with, the, she wants to play fetch. And that's the kind of understanding that Kate and Pal realize can still happen, is that eventually... And there's no resolution to this. It's it, it, the resolution to the whole problem. Of this episode is literally that, like, yep, Kate will stop understanding Pal at some point, but that's no reason for her to not grow up herself. And there will always be some kind of understanding between the two, even as they grow older. Um, I guess, and and really, that's the end. That's kind of the end of the episode. There's not really much more to say after that. I was almost expecting this to be sadder than it was. Like I was expecting them like when you when you see that like oh we've only got a, like a minute or two left this is the idea this is the idea of the episode this is what we're ending on. I was expecting the big tearful moment of like oh don't worry Kate I'll never forget you or just like you know we'll always be friends but they don't really have that. And that's not like a value judgment or anything it's just like that just doesn't happen. It's just like okay 
I will stop understanding Pal one day, but I'm going to keep talking and keep growing, and that's just the way it is, and we'll always have some degree of understanding together. I yeah, just Fetch feel like, is always there. Yeah, and I just feel like if this were a cartoon that was made five years later, maybe, they would absolutely take the opportunity to, like, get sad about it, you know? Mm, and again, not, not a value judgment, but I was just thinking of, like, how with modern cartoons, whether they're on PBS or not, there's a lot more focus on, like, emotional storytelling. And mm-hmm. I just think that, like, this was the prime opportunity for it if you were going to do it, but they decided not to, which is fine. But it's just it was just like, oh, it kind of made you feel like they were going to go a bit further, and then they didn't. Uh, yeah, the, it's, it's, always, it's always weird when the episodes just kind of stop because then there's no amazing way to transition into the next part of the podcast. So, uh... Uh, we'll, uh, we'll be, we'll be right back. We'll be right back. This podcast is supported by listeners like you. And here's how over on our social networks, you can follow us and find the latest updates and some fun photos. Facebook.com slash Elwood city limits at ECL podcast on Twitter, Elwood city limits.tumblr.com and Elwood city limits on Instagram. You can support us monetarily by going over to patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. If you become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, you get access to exclusive audio content like our new PBS Kids show, movie reviews, and sneak previews of upcoming content. Support us as well by going to teespring.com slash stores slash Elwood dash city dash limits dash store or search Elwood City Limits on Teespring. Buy yourself a t-shirt, a tank top, or a hoodie with the Elwood City Limits logo or an exclusive design by our friend Josh. Elwood City Limits is available online at libsyn.com slash Elwood City Limits where you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast apps. Is it not on your favorite app? Let us know. And you can always help us by spreading the word, tell your friends, and send Send us a message either on social media or an email, elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. Thank you so much for your continued support. And now, let's get back to the show. Well, this part of the episode I was very interested to get into because it finally fills in a little bit of a mystery that is looking at me from my bulletin board. We're talking about the pride of Lakewood. Because Buster, in the cold open, is having a yard sale where he is selling, among other things, a bunch of pins that he owns. Speaking of the and... among other things, did you notice the Easter egg? There's a woozle. He's getting rid of his prized woozle. Or his uh, oh, his woogle. Or is or is it his woogle? Yes. It's it is the woogle. Which was the licensed one? Like, what were the official ones? And there was like the fake ones. So, um, well, Arthur. Well, so Buster didn't have the fake one. Uh, Arthur had the fake one, and that okay. was called. Uh, I don't know if it had a name. It was just like a it was just like a weird knockoff from like a street vendor. So Woogle was the th- Woogle was the trend. Woozles actually exist in real life. Oh, they're really? Like to- they're like a toy from the late eighties. Oh, you're right, and it's a bookstore here. Okay, anyway, <laughs> uh, he but that's a little Easter egg. He's selling his Woogle. Um, I actually missed that. Thank you for bringing that up. And so of, of the uh b- the pins that he's selling, he's selling one that says "I like Pike." Which I'd buy that a- pin. I would absolutely buy that pin. <laughs> it's it's kind of catchy. And he says he got it for, like, eating fish and chips at a restaurant. There was another one that was, like, keep your paws off our animals, which is from when he and his mother attended a protest uh, to protest the uh, fact that his apartment didn't allow animals, which pretty cool. I like that he and his mom were uh, socially active in that way. But the one that has the real story and the one that this whole episode is about is a story about the pin for the LPC, which is a pin that you and I actually have because our patron Eddie sent us the LPC right. pin. But we didn't have the context because we hadn't watched this episode yet. Exactly. I've been waiting to kind of fill in the blanks on this for a long time. So this whole episode's about the story of the LPC. It starts when Francine is at a track meet between uh, Lakewood Elementary and Mighty Mountain. And she realizes that Lakewood needs new uniforms because she loses the track meet. But she, meet she, she loses the 100-meter dash because she's too busy adjusting her shorts, which, as someone who frequently adjusts their uh, pants or shorts or belt, I completely understand. 
uh, the awkwardness and the uh, lack of convenience in having to do that. So she pitches to Principal Haney to get new uniforms to encourage school pride, and it actually works, and we see the new uniforms later. But from this, uh, Francine, Muffy, and Arthur decide that school spirit is a cause that they should continue to promote, and they form the LPC, the Lakewood Pride Committee, to bolster school spirit. Lucas, were you ever much of a school spirit guy? I know you kind of are, no. <laughs> like, today in a way, but... Oh, well, that's my job, though. That, that's, and, what, and that's what I, I mean. And, and like, even it's, then, it's, it's, it's more so in a professional context. In high school, um, you know, I'm trying to think, like, all of those, like, rallies and stuff were, like, mandatory, so we kind of right. had to go, but... And we never had, like, a school spirit committee, committee rather. Um, we had a, like, yearbook committee, um, and there was, like... There, there definitely was, like, a cheerleading team and football games, and you know what? I am a, a Prince Andrew Panther for life, though I think they are finally uh, changing the name of that school for, for good reason. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't, not really, no. I wasn't much of a school spirit guy, and I most certainly was never a part of those extracurricular school spirit groups. Um, what about yourself, Will? No, not at all. Um, I found... I, I guess I still kind of do. I, the, the, the whole idea of patriotism of like pride in where you are currently has never appealed to me and Mm. it's didn't appeal to me as a high schooler or a junior high schooler it really doesn't appeal to me as an adult uh just going by what's going on here right now but yeah i've never been a really patriotic person don't plan on being one so this is a little bit harder for me to relate to but i know that it means a lot to the people who are involved with it So the LPC has a little bit of a slow start in trying to get people to be excited about Lakewood Elementary, as you would with most elementary school students. So they decide to court Buster to be their president. They kind of have a meeting with him at the Sugar Bowl. Uh, Okay, would Lucas eat it? Yes. I'm glad you – I wrote this down too. I wrote this down. Would I eat this? Dipping a pickle in ice cream. So – I, listeners, I respect you folks, and I know it would be much funnier for me to say, yes, I would eat this, of course, it sounds delectable, and for Will to go, ew, and, and you know, then we move on with the episode, that's how this usually goes. I have, one in, the cha- I have one in the chamber, ready to go. That's what's funniest. Folks, it's more important to be honest. I would mm. not eat the pickle dipped in ice cream. I love Woo! pickles. Okay. I love pickles. I love ice cream. It's just these are two things that must not meet. I am unfortunately going to uh, refuse uh, the pickle and ice cream offer. Though I am curious, what did you have in the chamber? No, no, I I had my ew, gross. Oh, you were ready, ready to go. go. Yeah. <laughs> The tape, like the tape, the tape was like my hand was, my finger was hovering over play <laughs> to get the tape going. But like, no, okay, good. All right, we've reached a limit. We've reached like what I feel is a reasonable limit for this whole thing. You've 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 said you you've talked some wild game on this before, mm-hmm, but I'm glad mm-hmm. that we have at least reached a wall. <laughs> yeah, Let's no, say. the 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 sugariness of the ice cream, the milky sugariness oh. mixed with the vinegary like bitterness of a pickle. It's just, I would say, suboptimal. And it's not that I'm opposed to ice cream and savory. I've heard people, you no, know, of course not. sing <laughs> the praises of their French fries and the shake. I've heard sure. that the French fry shake people will love to tell you all about that. But If you put uh, a yeah, French I'll... fry in some ice cream, you get a, you know. Uh, yeah, but okay. But at least, yeah, oh, just thinking about it grosses me out even more. But beyond that. They're recruiting Buster to be the pr- the president because he's you know he's charismatic and he can be a little bit more enticing to your uh, random schoolgoer than uh, <laughs> Muffy Arthur... calls him a gr- like average. He, she's like, oh, you're so average, so right. everybody will like you. We get another fantasy of Buster as the president of the United States, which we had seen before uh, in the Binky Told My Joke episode. Except this is more of a fantasy with like modern with like current Buster as the president and not like. 45-year-old Buster, uh, and he declares Baxter Day to be a real holiday. So replacing Christmas, I guess. 
He also uh, asks for the Oval Office to become a triangular office, mm-hmm. um, to which his th- his aide gives a really funny face. Uh, and, and to that, I say, uh, President Buster's aide is the throwaway character of the week. I don't know why it tickled me so much, his, like, shocked reaction of the president saying we need a, a triangular office. But uh, I, I thought this was funny. So Buster does agree. And they give him like a this straw hat with the ears cut out so that his big ears can fit in it. And they are going to have him cut. I was going to say cut a promo. Uh, give a speech uh, to the Lakewood cafeteria at lunchtime, and he's a little bit a little bashful to start off with. He does, doesn't have a whole lot of charisma, and he's you know he says I'm representing the LPC. And Binky goes, <laughs> What does that stand for? The Loser Patrol Crowd. Dude, B- so. B- Binky ethered him. He was quick with it. <laughs> I- I'm shocked the Buster was able to. It's a testament to Buster's public speaking ability that he was able to recoup and come back from that. Because someone made of lesser stuff would have crumpled, and that would have been the end of this whole LPC fiasco. Um, props to Binky for being for the, having that ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no pauses, no no uh, ums and ahs, no stuttering. He really, he really got it. When it comes to bringing people down, like Binky can do some wonderful, wonderful things. Um, but he does. But Buster does manage to rally, like you said. He kind of brings up all of the great points about Lakewood Elementary and does eventually sway the crowd into even agreeing on mass. What I liked is is that originally, you know, Buster does like the like, how about this? I can't hear you, sort of like call and response. But he does the like, does anyone else think this is the best school in Elwood City? <laughs> this is a very, very good muttering audio. I, I, I like the sound of the muttering. But he does manage to win them over. Everybody agrees. And we get a little montage of them spreading school spirit through, you know, bumper stickers, uh, new posters, all this kind of stuff. And we even this we even get like a music video of this. Right. Uh, yeah. They're singing a parody of the uh, the legendary Woody Guthrie's "This Land Is Our Land," so uh, replacing the lyrics instead of being about um, the United States, uh, it's about uh, Lakewood Elementary and how it's this school is our school. Yes, exactly, and it's not often that we get like an honest to goodness music video in an episode, so it was it was notable. I was like, oh, okay, we're. We're doing this. Cool. And it also makes me think of how, like, I think it's something I've heard about The Simpsons is, but I'm sure it's true of other television shows, is that every time that you do, like, a music parody, like a song parody, then it's like, great, then I don't have to write two to three pages of script. Mm, mm. (laughs) It's just just tip time. I thought this was a really tasteful homage. You know, Woody Guthrie, a a legend of American folk music, a, a... a modern-day troubadour, socialist hero. It was good to see him uh, paid tribute to in this Arthur episode of all things. Yeah, and it's I, I, you know, you associate this with Woody Guthrie. This is just something that I sang in like my, my elementary school music class. So I always just think <laughs> of it as like as like a standard almost. So I I always forgot that it's like oh yeah, an actual person wrote this. It didn't just appear out of the ether. <laughs> they they all we also get the um the. The I love Lakewood finger sign, the 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 gang signs here. So it's I L L. I yes. love Lakewood, and I just did it there. <laughs> it's the I L and L on your. This fingers. was really funny because they talk about it like it's a salute, but it is just straight up gang signs. Like they're throwing up the set, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> which which is funny. It's all finger movements in a very gang sign esque way, as opposed to kind of a bigger gesture that's usually associated with a salute. So I was like, damn, these kids really are kind of putting together some sort of gang. Well, it really escalates later on, but you're starting to see the beginnings, the seeds of what slowly becomes sort of a paramilitary organization uh, (laughs) to somewhere between a roaming street gang and a paramilitary organization out of this LPC thing. Well, and even, and even their like finger thing is like, they're ill. I L L. I thought they were going to make a joke out of that. Like, yeah, we're ill. True. True. Um, but yeah, you're right. This does take a little bit of a turn that I didn't foresee where the movement becomes so successful that it begins to weed out people who are not completely on board with it. 
So specifically, Sue Ellen and the Brain feel very pressured to join. They weren't they weren't asked initially, or they were just kind of like eh, like a little bit lukewarm on it. And they begin to be stigmatized. Like they have signs put on their lockers uh, that say "DLL doesn't love Lakewood." And Brain even says that George got one because he didn't cheer loud enough at the pep <laughs> rally. So I mean, ugh, listen, I don't want to make too much out of this. So I'll just say. I was a little bit uncomfortable with this. Well, just, Binky, just a tiny bit. Binky uses imitation, uh, intimidation tactics um, when they're <laughs> talking about, um, uh, like, how you get a free watch um, if you sign up. Binky, I think, I can't remember what he says, but he's, like, he's talking about how it's it's half past time to join. Uh, and he's <laughs> uh, you going from, you know, ostracizing them and separating them from the group to Binky actually, like, threading physical intimidation. Uh, it's really, really escalated to the point where we, we then cut to a meeting of the, the upper echelon of the LPC leadership. Um, and Buster is reviewing the latest speech in which he talks about, uh, tomorrow we will crush the opposition. Yeah. It moves into very, like, more overtly totalitarian rhetoric that I'm... Yes. Again, it's just like, oh, I don't really... Don't care for that. Just these days, this this time, anyway, you know. So, Brain and Sue Ellen are... God, I can't believe I'm saying this. Effectively, the resistance, as they're trying to get float into Buster's hands a letter... Uh, as Buster himself is beginning to become uncomfortable with the language that the LPC kind of main committee, as you said, is is starting to use, and they throw it to him in a uh, paper airplane, which Binky does an amazing save. He's like Buster's uh, secret security, and he does like a full on like crossbody and like pins him on the ground so that he doesn't get hit by the paper airplane. And they ma- so they manage to get the speech into his hands, and Buster reads it. Uh, or at least reads part of it at the uh, meet that they, the next like sports meet they go to. And because, because at this point, bust uh, brain, Sue Ellen and George are like sitting on the other side of the bleachers are just like physically um, uh, out- ostracized, phys- physical ostr- ostracized. Thank you. Physically ostracized from the whole group. And Buster makes a speech about how not wearing a button or not professing to be part of an in group doesn't make you someone who doesn't love your school, and he does stand with them. Uh, I will also note here that the new Lakewood colors are green and yellow, so very eye-catching. It's not the uh, it's not the aquamarine or the, the what is it like? The, it's like turquoise or like maybe like sky blue that the old uniforms were, but they're quite ca- quite uh, catchy looking. Yeah, it's 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 reminiscent of the uh, Elwood City Grebes uniforms are green and yellow, oh, aren't they? Oh yes, good catch. See, I didn't even think of that. That's yeah, it's good looking out. I completely passed me by. In fact, now that you say that, I thought they looked a little familiar, but I could not place it. And that's that's basically where we end up. Like everybody gets on the same page again of like, oh yeah, okay. Like I think Buster's right, and um. That's how Buster relates the end of the story. Uh, James, uh, little James is at Buster's um, yard sale. And so this is who he's telling it to. And then after all that, James is like, okay, I'll just get the I like Pike one. <laughs> and they're a little bit. And if, and, if, and, I, and I should mention, of course, I like Pike is a uh, reference to uh, I like Ike. The buttons from, was it the 60s or the 70s? when The 50s. Eisenhower, the 50s when Eisenhower was running for president. And that's, uh, yeah, that's how that one ends up. So <laughs> A lot of references to the mid-20th century in this episode, eh? <laughs> that's surprising <yes>. about. <laughs> in, in really stark and uh, sometimes <laughs> upsetting ways. But let's, let's roll it back. So, okay, so Paradise Lost wasn't exactly what you might have hoped for from the title. But yeah. with what we got, what did you think? So, as I said before, I actually think this title was a pretty ingenious use of of this episode because in a way in a way and this is a little bit out of the box but you know the garden of eden so to speak is um the ignorance of childhood um the the lack of responsibility and the innocence afforded to you as a young child and in this case a literal baby um and being able to communicate with pal and and all the things that go along with that and it's paradise lost in that kate must eventually grow up 
like everyone else. So I thought that was way cleverer. This is something where it's like, not only is this, a, a you know, one of those references that only the parents would get, this would even go over people's heads because they're not paying attention to the episode titles. So I thought that yeah. was quite literary of the the Arthur writers and, and, and very clever. So I'll give them that credit after all of my hemming and hawing and joking about the Paradise Lost. I'll also say that, you know, if we're going to have a Pal and Kate episode, and I was honest early on, I was literally dreading when I figured out it was a Pal and Kate episode. This is about as interesting as a place for it to go because we have some pretty high stakes here. Um, you know, the, before the highest stakes were like, oh, Pal gets lost or Kate gets lost or whatever. And now we have the, we have to wrestle with the idea that, you know, this magical realism of Kate being able to talk to Pal is only temporary and she'll eventually never be able to talk to Pal again. And I thought that was a really, uh, clever, um, and engaging way for a Pal and Kate episode to go, uh, cause I was wondering how they were going to deal with it all. And it's funny, you brought up, um... At the end, when it comes to a conclusion, you know, we don't get this kind of very emotional, tear-jerking goodbye between Pal and Kate. Uh, but, fitting with the theme of, of the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan mountain, we actually get very much a, a kind of mindfulness and, and very Buddhist uh, kind of conclusion. Which is to say that nothing is permanent. There is impermanence to all things. Um, and to, to live your life with mindfulness is the things you love that must go. You have to let them go, uh, because clutching to those things is what's going to cause you unhappiness. And so the, the way to be happy with this situation is to enjoy the time while you can and learn to accept your situation as it is. Um, and so it might not be, uh, as overtly emotional as it could have been. And you're right. There is an episode in here that they could have done where it's like this very kind of, uh, uh, ever, uh oh, people are crying like, pal, I'm never going to see you again, blah, blah, right. blah. Uh, but it said they just kind of uh, accept their situation. And you're right. The episode does kind of just end out of nowhere. Uh, and so the thing I would say is that it's a very cute episode. And I know that's not going to come as a surprise to anybody because it's pal and Kate. It's a baby and a dog. Of course, they're trying to be cute. But I mean, cute in all senses and that like, it's just kind of like, cute little ending on top of like, oh, everything's going to be okay. Uh, and you could, you could still have a relationship even if you can't literally talk to each other. Um, so all those things combined, uh, I liked this episode. I, I, I don't have a lot of negative thoughts about it. And I think that's pretty high praise given that it is a pal mm -hmm. and Kate episode, which we've had a plenty of negative things to say about in the past. Yeah, you're quite kind to this episode. I must say, I, w I wasn't quite expecting that. But I think, like you, the one thing that helps this episode is its implications for the future. And maybe it's maybe it's also just especially now when every Arthur fan is thinking about the future and thinking about the end of the show and, like, what's going to be happening. So this is, like, it's a little baby step towards the end of Arthur. Or at least Baby Kate not becoming Baby Kate anymore. Um... It's, so I found that very interesting. I always like it when they because they can only do so much, you know, as we've met, compared it to The Simpsons before. But I like when, when they kind of tease a little bit of like maybe there'll be a little bit of a change here. And this one was very interesting. Um, yeah, I, when I mentioned earlier that I would have expected this to be done differently, that wasn't a criticism. It's more me reflecting on like how and storytelling in television animation has changed a lot, even for shows that are meant to be for kids like end up having these like these like character arcs and multi-season stories and like emotional climaxes and stuff that resonate as much with adults as kids so here it's just like no this is we're we're not meant to get sad about this and in, in a way I, I i appreciate that for what it is too it's like it's not it's a fact of life is that kate's gonna continue to grow up pal will continue to grow up and they will lose this so I'm glad. I'm almost glad that it didn't. It didn't get maudlin. It didn't like brood about it. It just kind of presented it as it is, and then also offered a positive alternative. If that does make you sad, if, like this happens to everybody, but that doesn't mean that humans and animal, well, humans and animals, in, uh, in the context of Arthur, uh, can't communicate. But it, it's just, it just ends up being the way that we all communicate with animals, and very imperfect, but also in a way that transcends language itself. So 
I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always kind of in the middle about these. These feel like the Arthur team getting to do like semi Rugrats episodes, and it's just like, well, I'd actually just rather watch Rugrats. Uh, but it was not, it was not bad. I'm a little bit more in the middle about it. I just find it interesting. And I wonder if I like, I do wonder if there are any more Kate and Powell episodes after this, if there is like an actual end to this, I don't know. I'm, I'll just, I'll be very interested if we run across another one next season or two seasons from now. Yeah. So I can appreciate what was being tried for. Didn't love it or really even like like it, but I don't dislike it at all. So I'm very much in the middle. Also a little in the middle on the Pride of Lakewood, personally. I thought this was an interesting idea because school spirit is something that can mean a lot to some people. And this is the time when it's, you know, easy to whip kids up into a frenzy. It just, the second half of this episode ended up taking a turn where I was like, oh, okay. Like, it almost felt like you could, it felt like you could go several different ways with this episode. And they tried to go in every direction and it didn't really end up being much of anything if that if that makes sense because it's like you have the idea of like creating a school spirit thing which usually you could present as a positive thing and they do but then they also show the negative part of it which is excluding people which you can make into a whole episode but it's kind of more in the second half and then you have like um you have the story of like a character being at the head of something that goes out of control. And usually it's not like, you know, it's usually like all oh, the, the characters create a band and then like the, like everybody begins to resent each other or something that, that, that old trope. And you even have Brayton and Sue Ellen being like, we've got to bring this thing down from the outside. And it's like, there's so much going on. And it's also just like, once we start getting into like the, the way that we communicate, leaving people out of a group was a little too real for me in the way that they did it and, and I, I don't I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill here I'll just say that like literally right before we started recording this I'm reading mouse and I'm just like <laughs> ew, ew, ew. like well it, it felt a little icky to have like the Arthur characters behave like this even though they're like I get I understand the message it just feels like man and it, it's like it all started by we're just talking about a pin here so i felt like it didn't really come together with what it was trying to do like some of the ideas were interesting some of the sight gags were funny but it's just like eh. like i like i keep making that noise and just like that's how i that's how i feel it's just like eh. so that that's 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 where i come down on this on this story so I actually I, – I've come to the same conclusion as you, but I've gotten there in a different way. So okay. I, too, feel pretty middle of the road about this episode. I think that it tries a lot of interesting things and, and doesn't quite succeed. Um, and I agree that – I think the things I like the most about this episode is that I think it's actually pretty funny. I think this is um, – as Buster mm-hmm. episodes tend to be – um, I actually, <laughs> I mean, I'm not rereading Mouse, uh, but I actually thought the idea of these kids organizing themselves into what's essentially a a, uh, a paramilitary street gang, uh, you know, they're they're a three steps, they're like a little kid's version of the brown coats or whatever. Um, it, it, that didn't bother me so much, but what did bother me is that I think that the, the, there's a couple of things this episode tries to do that doesn't really earn. So, for instance, like, when Brain and Sue Ellen are ostracized from the group, I feel like they did this in the wrong order, where mm. Brain and Sue Ellen feel ostracized from the group when it's fairly innocuous. Like, at that point, it literally is just kind of a school pride group. Um, and so I was like, oh, why is Sue Ellen so, like, not into this? Like, I thought they were going to give us some kind of um, backstory or extra detail about uh, maybe Sue Ellen has uh, ex- had experiences with organizations like this in the past where she was on the out uh, on the out group or something. And that's why she can sense the canary in the cold mine for what's occurring. Um, but really, they never really explain that. And then, you know, things get really out of control with the secret handshakes and the we're going to smash our enemies and all that stuff. But it would make <laughs> more sense for Sue Ellen and Brain to be so turned off after that stuff occurred as opposed mm. to kind of being on the outs beforehand. Because at that point, I was just kind of confused. And I thought that, you know, 
Buster is kind of the protagonist of the episode, but also so much of it is happening completely outside of his control that I thought we were going to get a little bit more from Sue Ellen and Brain and their side of the story. And I think that would have added some balance to the episode. Um, but instead, they're kind of, you know, them being ostracized is really just kind of added in the third act. And it's very quickly, um, very quickly uh, comes to a head, essentially. Um, with Buster's speech and, and saying that, we, you know, you don't have to wear a pin. It's it's kind of the same conclusion from that episode of Seinfeld where Kramer does it. This is a much more fun analogy. Is It was reminding me of the episode of Seinfeld where Kramer won't wear the, the ribbon for the AIDS walk and everyone oh, gets mad sure. at him. Yes, um, yes, yes. A much more kind of literal example, uh, you know, with not wearing a pin and all. Uh, and, and one that doesn't uh, remind you of certain organizations. Um, but, uh, yeah, I thought that... It, 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 it tries a lot of things, and it, and it made me laugh, but it doesn't really have a good three-act structure, and it doesn't really come together in the end. And so it, it, it's a, it falls a little short. Um, though I will say I did really, really like the musical segment. And I think that if you were going to get anything sure. from this episode, um, if you could pull up a YouTube video of just that one little musical section, that's probably the highlight of the episode for me. Sure, I'd probably agree with that. Yeah, a little bit of a middling episode this week, depending on who you talk to. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we, t- we tend to run into those. And, uh, my goodness, Lucas, we are coming up to the end of an Arthur season once again. Uh, the next time that we are here on Elwood City Limits, we will be talking about the finale of season 13. Now, of course, as a reminder, next week is going to be our patrons-only podcast for the kids, a PBS Kids podcast. And it turned out that we tried a new system of voting this time where you could not everybody could see the, where the votes were going. So all of the, the vote casting was... Um, mysterious. And I think that led to our first ever tie in for the kids' history. So we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be going with the other tied option. And next week on For the Kids, we'll be talking about Sid the Science Kid. So if that's been a big show to you, you might want to consider going over to patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits and seeing what we have to say about it. We also have dozens more hours of For the Kids podcasts if you just can't get enough of Elwood City Limits. But if you want to wait for ECL in two weeks, we'll be talking about the final episode of Season 13, Looking for Bonnie and the Secret Origin of Supernova. Uh, Might also have something to say about the final Arthur episodes that will have come out at that point. We will see. And we hope we will see you on Saturday. That's this Saturday at... 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern, 7 o'clock Atlantic, 3 o'clock Pacific, twitch.tv slash Elwood City Limits Pod for our second ever stream. And this time, we are also going to make sure that we have a replay for you. So in case you can't be there live, hopefully you'll be able to see it once all's said and done. And uh, other than that, we just have Lucas Mancini Day to look forward to, which is coming up very, very soon. I'm happy to be celebrating it once again, and you'll be able to say Happy Lucas Mancini Day when you see us on Saturday. It's going to be a big weekend, Lucas. That's right. I hope to see lots of happy birthdays in the chat, or else. Absolutely. You better. You better. Get the LPC after you. (laughs) <laughs> well, for Elwood City Limits, that'll do us again. We hope to see you on Saturday for our Twitch stream. My name's Will Young, and for the birthday boy, Lucas Mancini, I want you to think da-da while I'm gone. We'll see you next time.